Namaste. So I'm back from India. I was in India for a few days, going to old familiar places and seeing good old friends. And um, one of them was my astrologer, my Jyotishi. Uh, his name is Ananda Chelapa. And he's a 10th or 12th generation Brahmana Jyotishi. It runs in his family. He's been doing it his whole life, <laughs> along with his brothers, father, and so on, the whole family. This is the best Jyotishi I have ever met. He makes all Western Jyotishis look ignorant. <laughs> I mean, really. He's the only one who ever looked at my chart and got it right. Uh, I mean, I don't know a lot about Jyotish, but I know enough to know when somebody's interpretation is off. And his is the only view that really nails it, that really gets who I am and also can prognosticate, can predict, can give advice because of that. If someone doesn't really know you, if they don't understand how your mind works, how can they make any predictions? Yes, they may predict things, you know, based on the body, but they're going to miss the really important predictions, like how do you feel? Or how are you going to act or have what kind of attitude you should have in upcoming circumstances and so on. These kind of instructions are much more powerful, much more useful than simply, you know, X is going to happen, Y is going to happen. Okay, you know, even I can get that from looking at the chart. The value of a really deeply experienced and knowledgeable Jyotishi is that, well, it's happened to me a couple of times, doing a reading on a chart and going into a kind of trance where suddenly you just see with the inner intelligence the person's karma, why they're here, what they need to do while they're here, where they're going in the next life, what's going to be the result, the big overall result of their whole life's activities. And then, of course, how does the present situation fit into that context? I'll say it again for the millionth time. Context determines meaning. So if you want to know the meaning of what's happening now, you have to see it in the context of the whole life. All the karma that's coming due, the prarabdha karma in this life, the, as a whole, as an integrated one thing. Then you can understand what's happening today, tomorrow, next week, next year, and so on. So anyway, he gave me a wonderful reading. We sat and talked for, you know, two hours or something like that. It passed like that. <laughs> Doesn't everybody love to talk about themselves? <laughs> well, our conversation went well beyond that, way, way up into the cosmic levels and so on, um, because we both know the language of Jyotish. And we both know the language of the Vedas. Now, this is called Consciousness Research Center, right? Why? Because the Vedas are the world's greatest authority on the science of consciousness. They've got it nailed, especially Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya's interpretation of the Upanishads which is the root knowledge, the core of the Vedic wisdom regarding consciousness and the evolution of life based on development of consciousness, which is loosely called yoga. 
uh, but is better known as self-realization, Atma Jnana. So this Atma Jnana, or realization of the self, Atma means self, is really the purpose of not only human life, all life. So anyone who uh, doesn't recognize this, doesn't believe in it, doesn't follow, doesn't pursue it, is basically an ignorant animal. That is our attitude, and then we got that from my Adi Guru, uh, Srila Prabhupada. The very first thing he taught his students is, you are not your body. You are the consciousness, the life force, the being within the body, sometimes called the soul. But soul is not a very good, not a very deep uh, term, and it's not really well connected with other terms in Western philosophy. So we prefer Atma, the Sanskrit word, because there is a complete explanation in the Upanishads as to what the Atma is, the changes that it goes through, and so on and so on and so on. It's a vast network of knowledge in the scriptures. So, after that conversation, I'm ready to jump right back into the Brahma Sutra series and pick up where we left off. In fact, I could do it right now, except I've got company coming over and I have to cook. <laughs> so, in the mood of Sri Lanka, maybe tomorrow. Huh? Like in Mexico, ah, mañana, señor, that anything worth doing is worth putting off another day or two. <laughs> so I'm going to start again tomorrow. And uh, I hope you're enjoying this series. Yes, I know it's difficult, but hey, life is difficult. I know it's complicated. But life is complicated. People are complicated. So, of course, any knowledge that describes the actual situation is going to be complicated, too. This is the thing. People want a catchphrase. They want a mantra, you know. They want uh, a meme that explains everything in two words. It just doesn't exist. It can't exist because of the nature of reality. Because things change. Now, I love the Chinese book of changes, I Ching, because it recognizes this. The book of changes is built on what's called a hexagram. Each hexagram has six lines, which can be yin, yang, changing yin or changing yang. And this enables any hexagram to transform into any other hexagram of the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. So in other words, the Chinese, basically their philosophy is anything can happen. <laughs> anything can and does and will happen. You know, because if it can happen, it's going to happen sooner or later. So studying the I Ching Book of Changes gives you a handle on that, on the 64 categories of change. And the thing about the six lines in the hexagram is that there's actually a hidden seventh line that's called return. All change occurs in six stages, and the seventh brings return. So often in life, we find ourselves in a situation that reminds us of something that happened before, isn't it? In fact, life is really a succession of such incidents, because everything we go through is an echo, is a reflection of what happened before. So this is the basis of astrology, this is the basis of history, this is the basis of, you know, all kinds of cause and effect scientific studies. And they make the assumption that the present 
and the near future is the result of the past. And to a certain extent, that's true. That's karma. Uh, but karma isn't the whole answer. Cause and effect can't be the whole answer because it only travels forward in time, from the past to the present to the future. There is also a type of influence, a type of causality that flows from the future to the present to the past. Huh? What is that? Will, creativity, thought power, visualization, desire. Because when you desire something, you visualize it as occurring in the future, isn't it? It hasn't happened yet. That's why you desire it, because it's not happening. <laughs> you want it to happen. So mentally, you create a future where that thing, whatever it is you desire, is happening. And then you take action step by step to bring that future into manifestation. Isn't it? That's called work or cause and effect, traveling forward in time. But then there's also this influence traveling backward from the future that you create when you desire. So see, this is the proof that the Atma is transcendental because it's above time. It's not in time. It can be in time. And it is most of the time for most people. But as human beings, we also have the potential to rise above time, to see the eternal view. And this is the purpose of spiritual knowledge. If everything in the material world is changing, and any situation can change into any other situation at the drop of a hat, huh, or less, you know, the wiggle of a butterfly's wing is somewhere in the cosmos, then the reverse is also true. That we can create whatever kind of change we want, in the view of the eternal, that which does not change. See, that's the three pillars of Vedic ontology. The past, the present, and the future. Being viewed from the standpoint of eternity. So, this is how we look at things. <laughs> that cause and effect are going forwards and backwards in time. And the influence of our consciousness and intelligence, vijnana, will, intention, the creative power, the force, if you will, that makes us subsidiary creators. And unfortunately, if, if we don't have full knowledge, We'll misuse our creative force to create, you know, things like war, climate change, and other kinds of suffering. And the beginning of suffering is to identify with the body. Therefore, all the spiritual authorities, and for me, it was beginning with my Adi Guru, taught as the very first item of real knowledge, you are not this body. You are the consciousness within. Everything else follows from that. And the challenge is to absorb a sufficient amount of true knowledge, the whole system, the whole network of Vedic knowledge, <clears throat> that you can derive further true knowledge and observations from that original knowledge. That is the status of a master. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.